remember that if you're hoping to stream the class, if you just click on streaming information there, you will get access to the webcast page and also the archive if you want to look at the lecture in case you missed it. Um, and just up here, I just posted my little uh, announcement that uh, streaming is not working today. So uh, that's unfortunate, but it's, it's pretty rare. If, uh, if that happens in the future, will they still be able to read? I guess we won't be able to record it. We'll just miss out on that. Oh, they're recording right now, but we'll just we'll have to archive it. So uh -oh. people people can't actually live stream it, which is what some people are expecting okay. to do. And unfortunately, today's like the first day they might have gone to do it. Um, but yeah, in the future, if ever the stream is not available, uh, you know that everything that I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to refer to the textbook, so the chapters for what we're reading are up there uh, and also the slides of the that I use for the lecture will be up there too so um, for instance today we're going to be talking about some of the stuff that are in this set of lecture slides so you can always access those you can read what needs to be read and all of the assignments are up on uh, um, our site as well on canvas thank you uh, so uh, I guess the easiest way to see those, because they're spread about week by week, but if you go to the, uh, not announcements, assignments page, uh, you can see them one after the other. Uh, so we've got a little extra credit that's coming up on September 4th. I'll talk to you about that next week. It would be especially good if the stream is working so people will hear about it. Uh, and then on September 11th, uh, we're going to do a couple of uh, short radio items adapted from some local news stories. So it gives us a chance to take a look at some print news stories and then extract the facts and turn them into something that could be read on the radio. And then uh, September 18th, where things start to get interesting, I hope, is where you'll be uh, bringing two story ideas to class to, to, and writing them up, of course, briefly to pitch, you know, saying, well, this is what I'd like to report on this semester. And so uh, that's between now and then, you know, give some thought as to uh, what you would like to report on. And um, again, next week, we'll have some ideas as to where story ideas come from. But, uh, you know, typically people who are professional storytellers like journalists, they always have their ears open for a kind of an interesting story. Um, and there are, you know, a there are lists of news values like criteria uh, uh, that journalism students learn as to what might make an interesting story. Um, some of those will come up pretty soon. But um, as I boiled it down for one of our uh, students, uh, and what I was told when I was became a, a researcher in a in a broadcasting uh, outfit was uh, we want to tell stories about interesting people doing interesting things. So that was the guidance that I really got, and it turns out to be not bad advice. You know, think about people that you have access to, people that you know, or people that you know somebody you know knows, people that you can. Um, get in touch with. Think about somebody who's doing something interesting and who could talk to you about it so that you can report on it. Yeah. Um, my job as a researcher was a little, you know, I had to go beyond that. It was like, could this interesting person be interesting talking on camera, you know, which is an extra. But you will just be recording interviews with them in order to take information and sound bites from what they tell you. You're not actually going to have to worry about can they talk for five minutes or 30 seconds or 10? So the main thing is, do you know somebody interesting doing something interesting? That someone you can get in touch with and interview. Um, and, and that would, you know, that, that's a, a compass to lead you to a story. So, so start thinking about that, you know. And um, questions about that? Anyone, any ideas? Is the writing you do on September 18th or do you write on uh, on September 18th will be like the two ideas, so a paragraph about each one. So the writing will be completed by that time? Uh, not the interview, not the information, but just I want to work on this story and I think I'm going to talk to this person. Two or three paragraphs. 
two paragraphs, yeah. It's written up here, of course, you can click on it anytime. So you want, you want two stories, not one. Yeah, an A story and a B. The reason for that is often one of your stories will fall through. The person you thought would talk to you actually turns out to lead you on a crazy goose chase. for, And so then you go back to your B story or, or whatever. Or perhaps both of them are going to work out and you love both of them. And so mid-semester you can switch and do the second one if you like. So it's really to give you a fallback and then also to open the door to other stuff you might want to do. Ron? So say if a shootout happened, who would you talk to? Say if what? A shootout happened. Oh dear, I mean, you'd have to. I, mean, I know it's like really extreme, but. Uh, you know, you're always thinking about who are the involved parties. So uh, you might be looking at victims. You might be looking at law enforcement. Uh, you might be looking at people who can give some context. You know, there's three off the top of my head. But again, that's a very dramatic type of story. It, do you know anyone who is involved in that? And it, that would be my first thing is, can you, can you access those people? So I'm not suggesting you open the newspaper, look on the front page and say, oh, this happened, and try to follow that up. Because very often, it's very hard to get people to talk to you. You know, the, the police will you know, issue a, an official statement, but they want to talk to all the television and newspaper media. They don't necessarily want to give you an exclusive interview as a student at City College. Unfortunately, that's the case. So, so that's why I say, is, this somebody, some, is somebody accessible involved? You know? Do you know anyone who was in a shooting, Ron? Mm -hmm. No, but I know like uh, someone, it happened in somebody's neighborhood right now. Gotcha. OK. So then it would kind of be, you know, who do you have access to primary sources? So you could talk to people who maybe were witnesses or who were around. And then you might be, you know, shaping your story as, you know, what's the response of the community to this? It's like, you know, are people devastated? Is this just one more in a string of events? And how are they reacting to it? So, so yeah, you, you may not, you know, you may be a little bit further away from it, but frame the story as, you know, how does the community respond or something. So, so that's definitely a possibility. Do you guys, would you see that as an interesting story? Would you be interested in reading that? Kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a possibility. Anyone? Yeah? For the radio feature script, um, would, like, say, for instance, you were doing a podcast, would that still work? I mean, from that perspective, I mean, you would be developing a script for audio. It's, yeah. It, so, to, for the, would, for it be, would it translate or would it not? I think it does, yeah. Um, you know, every organization has its kind of style guide as to how they want to see scripts written up. So we use, like, a really basic one that would be common to like a KGO, like a, like a, a terrestrial radio station news style. Mm -hmm. Or you might see it at KQED, at an NPR station or something like that. They wouldn't be using Word, they'd be using a proprietary system, but the output is the same. The script looks the same. In podcasts, it's much more kind of Free, free, flowing. free and flowing, yeah, yeah, right. You know, those those are episodes, maybe even daily episodes, but they're not 24-7 news organizations mm -hmm. that constantly pump out and update scripts for news. So, so uh, for this course, I don't see any difference. In the professional world, yeah, there's a difference. Maybe a big difference. You'd have a yeah. loss, but, I mean, they would be telling you exactly what you need. Yeah, so. yeah. Typically, you know, style guide, and it would be very much up to the individual editors as to how they want to see the stories and scripts laid out. Versus, you know, NPR will have a solution for the whole station, and everyone will feed into that, you know, and, and it centralizes the information a lot better. But for us, same type of thing, I think, you know. And so that radio feature script is, uh, you know, don't want to take too long on that because this is we're, we're going to look ahead to this when we actually do these assignments. But I'm asking you for a couple of story ideas, and I'm saying, well, who are you going to talk to about this story, or you know, the one you choose eventually? 
And then the week after, I'm saying, well, what questions are you going to ask that person? So you should get in contact with that person. And you may want to share the questions with them in advance if, if that makes them more comfortable or not, uh, which sometimes journalists don't want to share questions with uh, interview subjects before they actually see them. And then after that, I'm going to say, OK, take that interview. Don't transcribe it word for word and give it to me. But instead, go through that interview and find out all the information that you've learned and extract a couple of sound bites, a couple of 15 second or 20 second quotations of what your interview subject said and write a script which combines you know, your telling of the story of the information that they gave you with a couple of sound bites that they've actually said that would go in there. And we will listen to some examples of this type of thing, both from terrestrial radio and maybe from podcast world. But that's, that's the, uh, the thing I'm going to ask you to do. So, so, yeah. so that's interesting. So, so what we're saying here is that you already have the actual audio recording. So at that point, why do you need to do a script? Uh, because most of the story will be driven by you telling the story. Okay. So it won't be a type of report where it's like, hi, I'm Joe Reporter. I'm here on the corner where last night shots were taken. And uh, I'm interviewing this person who was here on the street. And they say, and you say, well, what time was it? It was about 11. And what were you doing? And I was walking the dog. And so, so, so what did you hear? So right? Essentially what you're saying is it just, we're just, we're di like it's like if you were making a, something that was visual, you're directing the eye or directing the ear. Absolutely, yeah. So it's not like just me having a conversation with a bystander, getting all the information that way. I have that conversation, but then the actual piece that I write is something like, uh, you know, it's been another occasion in this neighborhood which has had, you know, trauma recently. Last night, shots were fired. And today, uh, residents are still wondering what was going on. It was at the corner of such and such and such and such a place. Uh, and then you're going to play your 15 second sound bite of, I was just walking the dog. And then all of a sudden, I heard these loud bangs. And then I ducked. And I saw somebody fall across the street. And then you pick it up again. And you say, police were on the scene this morning mapping out what happened and talking to local residents and so on. So, far. so you see the difference. It's you, the journalist, who's driving the story in that way. And you're just using a few little bites out of the interview that you took uh, in order to you know, create, put characters into the story. But this is the most uh, compact and effective and let's, you know, somewhat cliched, but still very, it's very effective for you to tell the story in that way versus putting a 10 minute interview up where he's like, what were you doing? I was walking the dog. And what was it? there's a lot of useless information that comes in there that you can compress and say your way. So that's kind of the way it'll go. Okay. Ron? So two things. One would be, so it's better to be really concise about what to talk about in your, um, your interviews. Yeah, yeah. I mean, typically uh, a reporter will show up with advanced knowledge. So part of this, when I ask you, you know, radio interview questions and backgrounder. The background part is just what, what do you know already? What do you need to know when you go to the interview to, to be informed? You know? So uh, again, if it's a shooting in a neighborhood, can you find out any crime statistics for that neighborhood? Or just in talking to people, can you find out, is this a common occurrence? Or is this like unheard of? Or, you know, what are, and so you need a certain amount of background information before you go to the interview. And that helps you ask good, kind of incisive questions. And maybe you even have an idea of where this story is going. Like, I'm kind of like on the fly, and you don't need to accept my framing of, you know, you, you just ask, well, what if, you know, what if I know someone, or what if there was a shooting somewhere? And, and I'm saying, well, OK, I'm assuming you don't know who was shot, so can we back off? Can we tell the story of a community that's you know, responding to this or such? These are sorts of frames. So you may have that in your mind, especially as a journalist who has to do a lot of work, tell a lot of stories. Sometimes it helps to go in with an idea. It's like, 
okay, uh, this neighborhood, it's, it's really uncommon for a shooting to happen. Um, so my, my questions are gonna, you know, be angling towards not, is this an everyday occurrence, but sort of like, you know, this is a shock. What does this say to you about what's happening in your neighborhood or what do you think is going on here? So you'll be asking different questions based on the kind of frame that you bring to it, which is okay. The point is you gotta be, sh you gotta be ready to change the frame. If someone says, no, it's not that at all, if they change your expectations, go with that, because you're there to find out what their story is. But you usually have an idea of what you want as you go in. Yep. I have another random question. Uh, <laughs> OK, these are actually seen to all be on the same topic. <laughs> um, as far as like, like we're talking about like one specific thing, and we're talking about one source. Yes. What happens when you get multiple stores and sources? What happens at that point? It depends on the nature of the story. And when we get down to rewriting this as a TV package, I do ask folks to go back and find a second source. So if it's a controversial story where sources kind of give voice to different points of view about something, then you really have to try to work, I think, to get sources that express you know, the range of views that are out there. Sometimes it's not, you know, if I'm doing a story about a successful food truck or something like that, there may be a controversy or there may not. So Everybody might just like it. Exactly. And at that point, your second source may be more, okay, give us some context. Like how many food trucks are out there? It seems to me it's a growing business or growing air sector. And it's also getting more and more respect. You know, there are gourmet food trucks and stuff. So maybe your sources, your, your, your context, your second sources there are to give us more of a feeling like, okay, what, why is this important or meaningful or how does it show there's changes afoot, you know, versus if your story is about, you know, uh, too many classes being canceled at City College and you start off and your source is a teacher who's had their class canceled, that's controversial, and I think your second source should be the administration explaining why they're canceling courses, you know, because otherwise you're just being really one-sided. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, and that, that requires your critical thinking, like what are the sides in this story? Um, because you don't want to be caught blind, you don't want to present this as, hey, there's only one truth here, and then have a huge part of your readership or people in the community come back to you and say, no, you got this wrong, what about us? You know, and you're gonna to have to follow up and, okay. and get them in there. You know? so, so more sources is better. I think no, no journalism teacher would recommend just going with one source, because you're not there just to tell their story. Uh, and that's always the risk, you know. Um, so you, you got to check around and take everything critically. And typically, more than one source is necessary. But, you know, for these features, very often we're, again, telling the story of somebody interesting, doing something interesting. So they can tell their own story to start with. But if the, if the thing they're doing turns out to be controversial, we would very quickly want to move to a second source. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Right, before I forget, let me just take roll to know who's in class today. Um, so as you can see, in the first few weeks, we're going to be doing uh, writing that's basically intended to inform, uh, you, know, you know, and uses a lot of that for podcasts. Um, where do you folks get your news now, and how often do you consume news? What's, what's your vision of news? Where do you get your news? Anybody read uh, Ron? Uh, nowadays, I know it's not really a really good source, but Instagram. Okay. Let me just put social media as a source, and then we can go to Instagram here. All right. Of course, I wasn't even aware that they have a lot of news up there, so interesting. And yeah, Jesse? Uh, just like general search engines like Yahoo, Google and just type in news. Oh, okay. How often do you do that? Not all the time. Uh-huh. It's called search. Go Yahoo. Google. Okay. Other folks? Yeah? I think generally when you go on like any of those websites like Yahoo or AOL, usually the first thing that pops up is the news anyway. So like it's every time I go on, it's it's usually the first thing I see too. 
Okay. Do you notice the source of, the, of like who they're aggregating? Uh, it's usually just like politics that they talk about most of the time. Not yeah. Yeah. So like like KP but I'm thinking of the source maybe like CNN or that I USA would, Today. I just look at it and I'm just like, all right, I'll go to my email. So <laughs> I kind of just skip over that. Cool. Okay. Well, that's the second thing. Yeah. Source. Okay. That's that's interesting. Fran said Twitter. Oh. Fran said Twitter. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Twitter, um, and then the stuff that I'm subscribed to would be AP, the wire services, um, network news. Okay. So up we go. Wire, network news. You mean television networks? Mm -hmm. Okay. The TV. Uh huh. And local stations or local seriously stations. networks? Okay. Okay. Um, PBS NewsHour, um, KPIX, Cron. All those guys. Okay. Local, public, and national. And Mitch sometimes and CNN. Okay. And so uh, we could put cable yeah. and then CNN. I mean, every once in a while, yeah, I'll, I'll grab a newspaper. That's, yeah. You're a rarity, aren't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right. No, I just pick them up. Okay. Let's Let's go up here. Like nothing else to do. Like, all right. Get off the phone, get the print. Okay, so we got print. We got T. Anyone get news through radio? Oh, yeah. yes. Rarely. Yes. Oh. Rarely. Yeah. What do you What do you hear? Where? Uh, just those beginning radio stations on the FM, like the like eight point. I mean the eighty point something or I forgot which ones. But usually it's just those beginning radio stations start with like eight. Oh, okay. Or yeah. Just any one of them. Yeah, just one of those or any like. Uh, just shows that are going on on like my favorite station, which is not even okay. one. Okay, if they're on FM and they're in the 80s, that means they're public stations. There you because, go, yeah. Because the licenses were the, uh, attributed low in the band like 50 years ago or something. Mm, yeah. uh, the, those frequencies went to public radio. So, so if you're on FM and then there's the big AM stations, which are usually the number one in every market or like, you know, your KGO on AM. They're powerful stations, and they give out tiny little news chunks and lots of traffic reports and stuff like that. Does anyone listen to those? I don't get AM. I don't listen to AM. <laughs> okay. Uh, Things are changing. YouTube, MSNBC. Yes. Okay. Okay. And. Oh, I was gonna say some podcasts like the Daily. Oh, that's a great, that's one of my favorites recently. I've just gotten heavily into it. That's like my number one listen now. So, uh, oh my goodness. Okay. And the Daily is actually on NPR as well on some stations, which is a brilliant idea. Um, so let me see. We have, we have YouTube, which, uh, so MSNBC YouTube, does that mean that are these, are these clips excerpted? And then sometimes they're clips, and sometimes they're the whole show. Okay, okay, all right. So MSNBC on YouTube, and I don't know if the platform makes a huge difference there, except you know, in terms. Of, I mean, it does in a business sense to, to to these entities, but but the kind of discussion I'm hoping to have today is more about uh, you know, well, first of all, to get a sense of. Uh, who consumes news and media in, in which formats, and then also like what we think is news and when we're looking at these and good oh. practices and stuff. I also get it by email. Okay, you're on newsletters? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Newsletters, but um, Al Jazeera sends it by email. Okay. Um, As you say, they send what, a digest of what's running on AJ Plus, like mostly? Yeah, okay. All right, so I, I wouldn't know, should I call those alerts or? Uh, or it's the real content in some cases, right? Like, um, okay, and I wanted to put in podcasts there as well. Where the heck should I do that? So, wow, this is getting really uh, quite a quite a good source, right? So, so let me call this online, and then that way I can account for YouTube, and then I'll also put podcasts in here. Um, okay. Woo. Uh, another one. Like when you when this gentleman was mentioning about shootings, I like I I started to get hooked on it. I, I I've been I've been avoiding it, but it's it's a it's an app called the Citizen app. Okay. Where like it reports about like things that are happening around your neighborhood or in your city. Like if there's like a robbery or a shooting or a car accident or a fire or something, and it's 
It's so true, because like, I've, like, I've, I've heard people talk about it. I was like, nah, I want to avoid it. Nah, I want to avoid it. Nah, 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 nah. I'm like, ooh, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> there's also next door. There's like, next door has that along with classifieds and everything else. Yeah. yeah, there's a bunch of local apps like that. Yeah. And it's interesting that you're kind of distancing yourself from them. I try to, uh, just you get sucked in. Yeah, yeah, understood. And by the way, Jesse, meet Ron. This gentleman is Ron. This is Jesse. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, we had quite a debate about this uh, a couple of semesters ago, uh, precisely about this in that um, somebody was uh, actually was in chat participating online. They said, the news media sucks. I never learn anything useful. Uh, there's a shot in my neighborhood, and I can never find out what it is. And somebody, a journalism student, wrote back and said, well, you know, that isn't, you know, traditionally what news organizations cover. As, as tragic as a single shot may be, because it might kill somebody, it doesn't necessarily rise to the level of general interest which the news wants to report on. So, you know, something less deadly, but that affects more people, might actually appear in the news before a single shot in a neighborhood which is, you know, it's, uh, it's and something to keep in mind, an interesting thing to keep in mind about, about news, is it, it doesn't intend to report on everything. It filters looking for, um, you know, various um, uh, features that they call news values. And, uh, so, you know, any intro journalism goes through it, will go through it, uh, and, and it's just something to keep in mind. So. But, but I thought that was interesting in part because you know, the person was criticizing uh, the news media for a role that it's never sought to play, you know, and it really is happening because people aren't as aware as uh, they used to be about what to expect from news because news has diversified in incredible ways. Fran? Um, I don't know if this really counts, um, but um, Scan SF, which is uh, basically the police scanner, oh. and it's online. It's oh, really? Oh, gosh, yeah. okay. So so that's what the desk at a television station might be scanning all the time mm -hmm. to hear if there's anything up that they should send someone out to report on. You know, typically that's part of the beat is, is listening, and then the other part is, that, you know, you'll call the, the local stations, or maybe it's more centralized now, but you'll call early in the morning find out what happened last night, just to see is there something that we should report on, because things, things have, tend to happen at night. And, and, and it'll often, if your news day is slow getting started, uh, you, you can maybe use some stuff that happened at night just you know, as, as, as content until things heat up and the world begins to do different things. And you, repeat it, you report on that. So, so scan SF, thank you. That's something that uh, some folks may want to they want to listen into. I didn't. I didn't know that. But people been, you know, listening to the police radio for a long time to get, to get stories. And stuff. Yeah. Whew, wow. So there's so many here. You know what I mean? Nobody put Facebook up there. Nobody put Facebook. <laughs> I guess you know Instagram owned by pretty close, right? It's like last on the list. Yeah, yeah. You can't trust anything that Facebook says. You have to verify everything. There you go. That's that's the kind of thing that I like to hear. You know, you, you know, in this day and age, we got to look for sources and try to evaluate based on that. And of course, even the best of sources can be wrong sometimes or spun in different ways. And so you have to, of course, be critical even then. But yeah, yeah, good, good point. I like to hear that. You got to just question what you're reading rather than just completely dismiss it. Um, Whoa, there's all of this. Uh, it, yeah, so I mean, that does come to the, the, you know, the idea that, oh, I know what was like kind of sticking in my mind that I, you know, over the summer I noticed this um, in consuming my, my news through the Apple News app. And just the discussions I was having, you know, with my wife eventually, she'd be saying, oh, did you hear about this case or that case? And in each case, I was realizing that, you know, What's being turned up in that app is pretty borderline news uh, in in the early era of you know um, professionally curated and gathered news by newspapers and, and uh, you know I'm not again the news that the app is serving up is not false 
it's just very anecdotal and it's typically, you know, stuff that's really out of the ordinary, you know. This person let their die, child die in a car or, you know, because you, you know, they forgot their baby in a car. I mean, it's, it's bad stuff and it's very often seems to be, you know, designed to get you riled up or something, you know. It's, and, and again, it, it, they won't be posting, you know, uh, a dry story about the change of the consumer price index or something like that, although that may impact a lot more people. They'll be just, posting the ad. Make, it makes it more easier for someone to consume negative or just that type of story because it's juicy. Like it's, it's yeah. details. But, you know, people would rather read that than. It's clickbait. Yeah, than to actually highlight positive things that are happening in communities. Yeah. Uh, there's also kind of a movement of solutions oriented journalism or solutions based journalism. I do uh, I subscribe to a newsletter on that. Uh, where, where they do try to highlight more kind of, of progress rather than dwell on that. But, but yeah, I, I, think, I think, as you say, you talk about the juiciness, the, you know, it's the, it's the ability to have an immediate emotional reaction without thinking too much about these that is driving the selection of those stories. Mm -hmm. And there used to be other criteria, you know, that were at work, um, which were, you know, Maybe removed from what the audience wants and kind of paternalistic, but but they were different. They were definitely different. So we're we're in an era with with so many different outlets. There are so many different kind of approaches to the news, and I think the more you consume, the better. Uh, um, <laughs> I think the more diversified menu you have, the better. And I think you know we should remain critical and and, and skeptical of a lot of what we. Uh, a lot of what we hear, and, you know, and so on and so forth. We could go on forever. This is not like a media studies class, but, uh, you, you know, I wanted to get a sense of where you folks were uh, getting your news from. So print, how many people? Occasionally Jesse, Ramon, Fran, okay. So, uh, and... Um, Roman. Roman, thanks. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's not a whole lot of people. So. Uh, you know, homework perhaps is read a little print. This, uh, uh, this, you know, and, and like go to the Washington Post or the New York Times or something like that. Okay, as homework, just just to uh, get a sense of, of what that print is like. Uh, how many people watch television news? I watch the uh, what's that weekly show on HBO with John? John Oliver, this week, uh, last, last week, last week right. tonight, or something? OK. So we had four print. We had six television of all types. Uh, and online, everybody's, everybody's raising? No? Online. Online is pretty much everybody. OK, so I'll put a U there for unanimity. So you. OK. Well, this is really interesting. Um, and again, we should come back to you know, various kinds of critical observations about this. What I wanted to do today is, uh, given that anyone writing for media nowadays is likely to write uh, in, they're likely to write for broadcast of some kind. They're, you know, even if it's the New York Times has the Daily, right? Uh, they, so they're in the business of making a radio interview show, current events. They have video pages. Um, so does the Chronicle, you know. Uh, KQED, you know, which is a, a broadcaster, has a blog. Uh, so they have to produce print. Um, so if you look at any of these media outlets that exist, all of them have kind of converged, and they're all doing a little bit of everything. And I think, you know, for people who want to write for the media going forward, you should be accustomed to working in all three, if you want, of these major formats, print, broadcast, online, or web, whatever, let's call it web, right? So I wanted to uh, explore with you um, the, the, the major characteristics of each of those. So we would have, uh, let's, let's again, I, I'll give print, uh, Top billing and then broadcast and then web. 
So, and let's say what we're trying to find out about here, uh, just between us, is what we think are the strengths of each of those media are. Again, it would be lovely if for those, we only have four people reading print, uh, but you know, think back, I'm sure in your life, you've had access and you know, seen people working with newspapers. So think of a newspaper, you know, black and white, print it on paper, pick it up, pay 75 cents, or used to be much cheaper. What would the strengths of the newspaper be as a, a medium for informing us? I think, I think for me, was grabbing the newspaper felt like the confidence that I know I'm getting a real credible story. Okay. Credibility, all right. And part of that comes from, you know, it costs a lot to generate the, 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 the product, right? You had to have printing, presses, you had to have trucks, distribution points, plus reporters, editors, all of that. I think that and then the like, also just like trusted reporters, like you know that like, for example, like in the sports section that you know that Ray Rattle is always going to be covering some, some stuff for the 49ers and you know you're going to get some more detailed information. Got it, got it. Other, other points? Mm -hmm. Well researched. Well researched, okay, so that's partly credibility and I think Jesse also said and as I think this is Fran, you're following on it. It's kind of detailed research. Can we say that? Mm -hmm. Like in a newspaper, are you likely to get more information in, uh, in an article in a newspaper than you would, let's say, out of a news story uh, on, the, on the local TV news or something? Probably not. <laughs> I don't know. I feel <laughs> like with the newspaper, like you have, well, at least with the broadcast, you're only limited to the amount of time that you got to give out your report. You got a couple minutes. Yeah, you got like, two minutes of get it all out. I feel with the newspaper, like it could go on Yeah. and it could go further. Yeah, so let's say detail and depth, right? Because, because you know, you're gonna, you can hear exactly, you know, exact numbers. You can get uh, a lot of uh, detail. And when it comes down to broadcasting, a lot of time is spent on imagery, on, on you know, suggesting stuff. Uh, not as detailed. Okay, good. This is going, I, 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 I misunderstood you and I was kind of going, what? Broadcast more detailed? Uh, oh, I was going to say you have more time to absorb the information on print. Yeah, okay. Broadcasting. Like once it's, they only say like once on the news and if it's like a really popular story, they'll keep going back to it. But like usually on news, they just say it once and then that's it. Yeah, that's right. With print, at least I can go, oh, okay, I can read it at my own pace. Yeah, and it's a good point that uh, when we write for broadcast, we have to bear in mind that people are only hearing it once. Yeah. That's a good point. So we have a chance to, you know, reread or, or uh, how can we get, we, we determine, let's say we determine the time that it takes for this. Fran, did you have a hand up? Yeah. It's portable. Portable, awesome. Yes, right, there it is, <laughs> portable. So it's true your phone is portable too, but the newspaper is, you know, you can leave it in the corner, pick it up, someone else, you hit Starbucks, it's like, oh, there's a pile here, let me see. And you can take it with you and, and consume it. Yeah, absolutely, portable. So that's interesting, because that's typically something we think about with a mobile phone or something. Ron? Uh, I've had it has something, but I don't really have anything. Okay, all right. Well, next medium maybe we can get. Anybody else got anything on newspapers right now? Yeah. I, mean, I was going to say, uh, well, after you're done reading it, you can, for me, I use it for my dog. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. Reusable, right? Well, practical. I, don't, I don't know if that's a news, <laughs> yeah. it's not a news value, but it's a use value. Ron, that sparks up. Or, no, I was going to say, like, uh, at least with the newspaper, you won't have at least 16 other web pages of the uh, same food news. But then okay. at the same time, it's like both have that same thing. Like each newspaper has like a different kind of source. So yeah. It kind of balances, uh, it kind of counsels each other out. Okay, but your first point was that uh, it's sort of more focused as a medium than uh, web pages and stuff, which tend to kind of fly off maybe. Yeah, like if you Google stuff much. in, like if you Google stuff in, uh, trying to find news, you end up with like 16 other websites and pages. Yeah. And I'm guessing if you still apply one newspaper, like you're really faithful to it, and that was just, then that's just your newspaper. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it does, it does tend to be a more kind of a 
you know, like a gated area for, for news, definitely. And it makes the promise of credibility. I think that's quite true. Uh, you, you know, in a story, you can go deep. You can get into more detail than yeah. perhaps the web uh, can compete with that or offer more. And in a way, the web is a combination of other forms. Uh, you can take your time with it. It's portable. It'll be with you. Anything else? Yeah? Um, well, I was just thinking that um, if it gets wet, you can still you can dry it out and still read it. OK. It doesn't break. It doesn't break. <laughs> 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 Interesting. Okay. Forgive me. I won't want to write that one up. But I left off the, the, uh, the yeah, reuse yeah. of the paper as a, yeah. as a doggy target as well. But I think one more thing, it's kind of, it's still the archive medium. You know, you can, you can go back to 1872 on the New York Times website. You can actually get a PDF of the whole newspaper from 1931, if you want, right? Uh, versus things on the web, there is this potential, you know, for web publication, but it tends to come down and disappear, you know. And, and uh, versus the newspaper has an investment in being around for the long term, you know, like the the cliche is the first draft of history or something. So, and it used to be before we could Google stuff or whatever. That archive was their, you know, part of their research. You know, I mean, you couldn't go to the web and search a bunch of stuff. You'd have to go to, you know, the um, to to the section of the newspaper that had all the clips and have them pull the clips for you and read those. And, you know, or microfish. You know. Yeah. I didn't do it, but I thought about it the other day when uh, when that whole thing happened with Paul Manafort and, and uh, Michael Cohen in the same day. Mm. I was thinking about buying Washington Post and New York Times, and then just saving the paper. Okay, because and the, a... the reason the reason why I thought of that is because I saw somebody they had they they had uh, <laughs> two different papers of when Elvis died, mm -hmm. and then when somebody had just saved them, and wrapped them up, and then when they found them, they were worth like 150 grand. Wow! Each. Oh my God! So. <laughs> Amazing. I think that's the yeah, idea, which is cool because I, I have collections of like when. The Warriors won the championship, or 49ers. like the Giants, or the 49ers. Like I have like stuff from back in the 80s that of, of the 49ers winning Super Bowls, and so I think it's that's the cool thing about it. I feel like with the print that you could have that. Like it's a material have, object. Material, yeah, you yeah it's, it's not digits. It's yeah. Not, yeah. Right. Good point. And that's how sometimes if you buy a newspaper and sit there and read it, you feel sort of like old school and traditional instead of <laughs> instead of out of date and silly. You know so. OK, cool. Well, let's think about broadcast. What does broadcast do for us that uh, print can't necessarily do? Oh, more visual. Yeah, visual, for sure. And that's real important in, in, uh, in television, of course. And we could also say in radio, uh, you know, shows like Radio Lab. Does anyone listen to Radio Lab on NPR? Mm -hmm. Ooh, it's pretty amazing. I, I, I highly recommend it anyway, in terms of an almost musical presentation, audio presentation. I mean, there is so much care taken in the editing and intertwining of sound in there. Uh, so let's just say auditory. Uh, so it definitely addresses the senses in a way that's probably pretty compelling. How about timing wise? You know, we said here that, uh, you know, you can reread, you can take your time. Do you, do you take your time with broadcast usually? No, because it's presented to you, you have no control over what they present to you. Right, right. At least up until very recently. Now, you know, you can go to YouTube and see the MSNBC the bit that you missed. But, but it, it comes on the schedule, which yes. can be really positive in that I know that my morning news starts at 5 o'clock every morning and uh, the 10 o'clock news is on at 10 o'clock every night. Right, so it, it leads to appointment consumption, which is great for advertisers. And it's also pseudo-liveness. And this is something that I don't know if you guys have noticed, but it's like the 10 o'clock news 
And uh, there was a big decision at City Hall, and you know, it came down at 7 o'clock. And there's the reporter standing in the dark in front of City Hall, and it's 10 o'clock. You know. Why are they there, right, standing in the dark? Well, it's because they want to get as close as they can to sort of the liveness of the moment. So broadcast is really big into, you know, we were there. We were out in your community on the corner when it happened. Even if they get there too late, they'll, you know, it'll, we, we even write to suggest that things are ongoing. You know, there was a shot in the neighborhood last night. But when I write that up, it's like, and I'm on the street corner this morning as the police are taping out the event and trying to figure out what was happening. You're always trying to, have, even if it happened last night, you're finding the moment into the story, which is now. So as, as pseudo as it is, liveness is a big part of broadcasting. So a big fire with lots of flames and visuals and stuff that is happening right now that's a great kind of television topic, okay? I mean, local TV news type topic, right? And we'll see, we'll see them go crazy for, you know, wildfires in Redding or, Sonoma, or earthquakes in Sonoma or, you know, fires or whatever, because those are big visual events that are kind of like ongoing happening on a live visit. Anything else? So on the back of that, then I would say breaking news. Yes, breaking, right? So they're trying to be as close as they can breaking news and of course your print schedule is like now it's once a day if you're lucky right As, you know uh, versus broadcast you got more periodic breaks uh, so that's an interesting thing to think about timing even, yeah, after the web even with the broadcast it's scheduled breaking news because you know that the news is only going to be on from five to eight so yep. anything that happens between that time that's that <laughs> Again, the word pseudo is in order, right? You know, and a lot of effort and money is, is pump, pumped into that, <laughs> oddly. Uh, one more thing I'd want to point out about broadcast is uh, the, the, the appeal to emotion. Uh, your, your ability to hear someone's voice quiver or to see them tear up or uh, to, you know, to show the horrible hoarding that's in that person's apartment or something like that, uh, it creates emotional reactions in ways that, you know, hearing somebody quoted in print doesn't give you the same effect as hearing them recorded and, and you know, hearing their voice, their character, their voice change and stuff. So, so it's a very emotional appeal in, in broadcasting, linked to the visual auditory thing. But, um, so when, you, when you're saying broadcast, you're specifically maybe talking about local news, maybe? I'm mushing, I'm mushing everything together to kind of make okay. a point. But yeah, and, and, but please go on. You're well, thinking. See, like if you're, if you're talking about like maybe like say MB, MSNBC, for instance. Everything tends to be really focused and um, just pressed together. Because <laughs> um, sometimes they don't talk about much. They'll talk about different forms of one thing. Like right now, we, they just talk about Trump. <laughs> the last year and a half. So yeah, yeah. So they don't, you know, like there has to be something incredible to happen for them to talk about something else. Uh huh. Uh huh. So I don't know. It seems just it seems like really maybe maybe a little bit myopic. Yes, possibly. Again, we're not a media studies class. We're trying to think about you know just writing our own stories and how we're going to do it for each of these different media. But I, I wouldn't disagree with you. You know, I I'm not drawn to the cable news talk medium myself. Um, but I do. You know, I mean, I think the every news outlet is has been. Uh, tied to every word of Donald Trump, I think it's I think it's in, an amazing phenomenon that that a, you know that that the guy can get so much coverage, and mm. I'm pretty sure it plays to his advantage, even if the coverage is bad, and I think he knows it. But who knows about that? You know, again, I'd, I'd rather we, you know, we're we're doing this for the reason of of educating ourselves as to you know when we come to write an, in a a web story. Uh, we're going to take a different approach than when we wrote, like a you know, let's say a radio story or a television story for broadcast, and we're going to be more consumers of print. But so first of all, web. I wrote down here timing. Um, you know, 
So print comes out once a day, broadcast comes out, you know, at 6 o'clock, at 10 o'clock, at 6 a.m., at 10 a.m., at noon. When does the web publish? 24-7. Exactly, constantly. So on the web, we expect to get the latest news, you know. So timing is, it's, you know, whatever, as close to real time as they can get. All right, and that's what people expect. There's an earthquake, you right away go to the web and you expect to see something about it within minutes. You know? Versus the newspaper will be sending people out, calling people, getting something ready for you know, when they publish, if they can. So web, always up to date. And that means when you write, if you write a piece for the web, you often want to disguise those kinds of indicators which show that, hey, this was written 12 hours ago. So, you know, in broadcast, we're always trying to give people the idea that it's live, that we're there, it's kind of immediate. In web, we're trying to hide the fact that this may not be the very latest news yet. Uh, so, you know, web, real time, as, as much as it can be. How about depth and detail? How about that for the web? I think it has every bit as much as print, if not more, right? Yeah. And, and what else does it offer? in addition to, you know, being able to write endless pages yourself as a journalist. What else can you do on the web? I think you could edit and modify your story right then and there. True. So then there's, that's also, and that's something to, to pay attention to. Let me put that under real time. Let's call it editable, you know, and not every media outlet actually says when they've updated a story, you know. Again, the big credible sources will, you know, they'll publish that they misspelled someone's name or misattributed or something. But a lot of, you know, lesser web publications that are still news will not tell you. Uh, but how about uh, this aspect of being able to link to documents and stuff like that? So, so on the web, you can, you know, link to primary sources. So we've called primary sources people that you interview. But primary sources may also be publications or other sources of data, court proceedings. Uh, you know, real estate deals, uh, tax information if it was ever released. So those kind of primary documents that you can actually, you know, put a link into your web story and it gives you extra credibility. And it also maybe engages a particular type of audience that wants to see that, you know? Um, another thing that it allows you to do is it allows you to aggregate multiple sources, whereas uh, uh, the print and broadcast is presenting you with ones, you can do your own research on the web. Okay, yes, okay, good. So I'm just going to put aggregate there. That's a good point. Uh, another thing that the web provides is interactivity, right? So. I noticed a lot of, well, you know, there's, there was moderate, moderated comments underneath some news stories, and then they started getting out of comments because the comments were so rude and stupid, it seemed like, <laughs> why bother? Uh, and so now it's, it's very interesting to see, you know, w what avenues of interactivity are offered, but beyond comments or there's also, you know, you can do a timeline, you can do, uh, you know, so, so people can interact with the content in different ways that are not structured by the way the news story is written, but you can put it all on a timeline or you can do a map uh, of all the local restaurants with, you know, their health ratings or something. Or there was a notorious one that was done in Upper New York State. They did a map of all the gun owners because that's public information is, you, you know, you, the fact that maybe only in New York State, I'm not sure, but in New York State, if you have a gun license, that's public information. And so this smaller local paper got all that and then made an interactive map of who, who has a gun where without using their names and stuff. But they were, <laughs> they were, uh, uh, they were severely criticized by the NRA, you know. Uh, and yet it was public data, and so they didn't do anything wrong by just simply turning it into a map just, and showing where all the weapons were clustered and stuff. Interesting. So this could be, you know, yeah, this, could, this can be provocative as well as informative, you know, which, which I guess they were hoping for, but maybe not that much. So may, maybe there's more. Yes, Jesse, yeah. Another strength is as compared to like print and broadcast is like you, you're, you're just choosing your stories, what you want to see. 
Got it. Yeah. So William says you can aggregate and you can also you can, you know, be selective. So let, let's call that personalized. You can personalize your media uh, diet, which, you know, again, a lot of traditionalists say, wasn't it great back in the old days when, you know, uh, the journalists or the editors at the New York Times told you what you needed to know and the rest of the world kind of followed that lead versus now you don't even know what's being said in a lot of, you know, different media. And in fact, you know, go when you're using search, Google is learning what you like and it's no longer kicking up links to alternative media sources that you might not like. So not only is it you sort of self-selecting your reality, it's the, it's, it's the, uh, uh, the algorithm that's also putting you in a box and then feeding that box with you know, the same information. So that, that's a big concern, I think, too, for a media studies class. Yeah, Fran? Unlimited content. Unlimited content, right? It could go on forever. The newspaper, you had to worry about length. Uh, the web, and Ron raised this, I think, you know, kind of in it, the downside is that you could just have endless expansion of stuff and who knows if you're interested or not. But for sure, you can write a 10,000 word story or you can write a thousand word story. It doesn't really matter technically because the whole thing is published electronically, but in a newspaper it was super important, which is why we have stories, you know, built in that inverted pyramid format where the most important stuff was up front and then the least important was here so that if you needed extra space you could just chop the bottom of the story off and that led to a particular style that we'll go into. Okay, so we got some ideas up here about um, the strengths of the media. So we're going to keep this in mind when we write, you know, for radio and TV. We're going to try to make things sound as though they're ongoing. And when you adapt it for the web, we're going to give you, you know, some recipes to follow. How to adapt a broadcast story for the web. And I'm going to ask you, well, what would you add as extra stuff to a web version of this story? So I think that would be, these are things we want to keep in mind. But now, uh, I mean, this has been a great, uh, a, a great um, discussion anyway to start stuff out. I sometimes do this as a, uh, an exercise in class, especially if there's a little more time and everyone's present. But um, what I've done here is um, I've, I've created, just sort of fantasized some storylines. And then I say, well, which medium would you choose to tell this story? and why. So just quickly, there's five of them here, and if you feel like it, you could explore all of them. And for those who are consuming this in the archive, you could also go through it that way as well. But story one, at this moment, a fire is burning through a luxury apartment building in your town. Dozens of people had to evacuate, and the flames can be seen for several blocks. Which medium do you think you would use based on the strengths? Yeah, William? Using my test taking skills uh, at this moment leads me to believe that uh, it's an immediate happening that sh needs to be covered right now as it's happening. So I would want it to be on television. Yeah, yeah. Other reasons why TV might be good? Visual. Visuals, flames, people being evacuated and traumatized and stuff. Yeah, okay, cool. Do we have any, uh, do we have any other ideas? Anyone want to argue for a different medium, Ron? No, I was just gonna go ahead with TV. It's like instantaneous. It's like you know one of those emergency broadcasts. Yeah, it just happened like that. Right. Happening live. They don't very often cut in for like a fire or something, but if it happened at ten, it'd be perfect. Fran, did you want to say? Um, I'm gonna also advocate for print. Uh huh. Um, because I'm a photographer. Okay. <laughs> and there may be some things that a still image can capture that you may miss. You may see it, but everything's constantly yeah. going, so you just, it's out of your brain already. Yeah, yeah. I, I love photojournalism, and there's interesting ways to combine that with sound as well, to do kind of a, you know, uh, a testimonial slideshow. I have a beautiful one of the Boston bombing, and I don't know if it, was, it won a lot of prizes. I don't know if you've seen it, but we may look at it. Yeah, okay, so print, but, and, but we're still using something visual there, and I think a lot of us came down for TV. Uh, let's move to another story. Uh, there's no right answers here. I think a lot of the media have to cover all of these uh, anyway. 
But here's another one. The state has released a list of all 300 restaurants in your area that have violated health codes 10 or more times in the previous year. In addition, they have released another list of the 2,600 restaurants that have consistently achieved A ratings over the past year. What would you put that in? Ron? Online. Online? Okay. I heard print. I heard online. I would have said online first, print second. So tell me why online. Um, well, first of all, it's just more, it's more like food based. So even when, even when he, uh, for, is this information already been released, people who already eat paper uh, who weren't sick but have already gotten sick, and it's just not really that newsworthy. Okay. It's not really that important. Okay. And besides, we even got yelp for that. Oh, got you. Okay. Well, I, what I was thinking when I concocted this was that, you know, I was thinking, well, there's a whole huge list there to accomplish, and but also your audience might be interested in knowing this to stay away from these places, and Yelp wouldn't actually give you systematically this type of information. So, so that's why I was leaning that way. But I, well, Jesse, you were saying print. Ramon, what were you thinking? Well, I was gonna say online too. Online. Because okay. You just change the list later on. Okay. Before you print it. I got it. Yeah, you can always update that. If one of them becomes your advertiser, you can take them off. Yeah. No, you wouldn't do that, would you? That's that's for our ethics or they discussion. Just, you know, change their habits. Right, right. They, on. yeah. Eventually, that will go out of date, right? If they do, they'd be like, uh, oh, you know, we got a bad review. Let's change that. Bad yeah. Review, number one restaurant. Or something. Yeah, yeah. Restaurant health map. I'm not sure there was at some point here. Uh, uh, it's, uh, Oh, there we go. Yeah, this is it. So this is this is actually something that you can do online, right? Uh, as you go through here, so it even has up pops. The I guess we have to like zoom in on this a little bit or stuff. The Bouchon Bakery got an A, nine violation points. So, so this is something you could do online too, right? Which is which is a lot of fun for uh, for us too. But I guess it's also interesting. I think the interactive part of that would make the internet really cool about that. But I think for me, it's just like hey, I'd rather just have a book and know. Okay. Understood. Yeah. Yeah. If I ever need to look at it, just grab a book. And then online, you could also uh, hyperlink the uh, restaurant locations or websites. Yeah. Yeah. That would. That would. I don't be think this type of information would go on TV at all. Though. I agree. I agree with that. It's yeah. there's a little bit too much information. Yes, I think it's too much to comfortably accommodate. You know. Uh, lists of three are about all you can do on television, you know, honestly, because after that, people won't remember them. But how about this one? Story three, a four-year-old child in your area is now considered one of the finest young violinists in the world. That's despite the fact that he has to stand on a chair to use his music stand and he watches Clifford the Big Red Dog on practice breaks. What would you use to get this? Paper. Sorry? Pa or print. Print, really? Wouldn't you want to hear what he plays, though? I mean, I guess you could also put that on TV. Yeah, yeah. What else? I, I was frankly... I, I thought TV, too. I was pushing people towards TV. Uh, because of the... Because, well, you know, because of the, you know, this, this, the sound, you want to hear that he's a virtuoso. And, and I guess the other thing is, you know, this is not exactly hard breaking news, right? <laughs> so this is more like the kind of item you get at the end of the... You know, the end of the newscast, you know, that, that little bit of public interest, quirkiness or something. So print, print doesn't usually assign a lot of space to this type of story, but television gives a certain amount of time to it, in part, you know, to put you to sleep on a more positive <laughs> note. You know, no, seriously, it's like, right? I mean, most of TV is, local TV news is like, you know, uh, what is it? If it burns, it turns? Or <laughs> if it bleeds, it leads. If it bleeds, it leads. Thank you, Roman. So there you go, right? And so at the end, <laughs> at the end, you don't want to put people to sleep and give them nightmares. They won't want to tune in anymore. All right, story four. For the past six months, you have had access to the state's only mental hospital for children. You have been able to talk with several family members who are very worried about conditions inside and administrators who say they just don't have the money to make it better. However, you have not been allowed to get any pictures. So how would you cover this? What's the best medium? Do you radio. Print. Oh, radio. That's an interesting idea. And again, I was, I was uh, leading you up to print. So let's first hear for the case for print. Was that Fran? Did right. you? Oh, 
I said radio. Oh, you said radio? Okay, well, we want to hear radio again. Yeah, what did you um, think? Just because it's an in-depth investigation. Um, so there's yeah. going to be a lot of information, and plus there's no visuals. Yeah. So you can't yeah. put it on television. Yeah. <laughs> and, and newspapers seem to do a good job about a recurring story like this, where you know it unfolds over several months. I don't know exactly why that is, because television could also refer back to reporting they'd done six months ago. But an ongoing series like this, I, I think, is a real strength for print. Well, also, also, it would be difficult if, if it was on um, online as well, I think. Just because, like we said earlier, it's unlimited. So it's hard to get people to pay attention to one thing. Like, Interesting. If you're looking mm -hmm. for it, like, like, say, for instance, it's a Washington Post, then you're going to see it. And it's gonna be, you're gonna be like, oh, this person's name. And yeah. You're gonna follow the story. Yeah. But if it's like online, you could be looking anywhere. Yeah. At any time. Yeah. So you could easily forget about the story after you read it one. Yeah. Read yeah. one of the pieces. Yeah, that's that's a point related to a particular thing that that I learned in this class right now or something, which is, you know, that that the old media, the print media, with the fact that they curate and they filter for only certain very important stories, if you take a story like this and you put it into print, you kind of elevate it and say, this is really important. If you put it online, it may get lost in the shuffle, which I think is what you're saying. Yeah. And, and I had never really thought about that. Well, with, uh, see, I keep bringing this up, but I feel like a terrible person. Um, but like, like even with you know like because like we're saying they're so focused on trump mm -hmm. but there's literally stories about him that we already knew but they got buried mm -hmm. because they're so focused on everything that's happening instantly oh uh, yeah yeah so there's also these also these tiny little stories which are actually huge stories but you don't know it because you're paying attention to yeah only one piece yeah yeah well it's another again uh Media studies type issues, you know, where, you know, media manipulation, right? It's a shiny object that distracts everyone from all the other stuff that's going on. Um, radio, how so? Because um, I've been in situations where they said, oh, no pictures, okay, cool. Can I record? Can I record you? Get, you know, some audio clips. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think that, would be, uh, that would be interesting. I hadn't even thought of that. Um, Anyone seen Spotlight, the movie? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Great movie. Check it out, folks. Spotlight. Uh, that's the fiction film treating, you know, the Boston Globe. They had this uh, section, a few journalists, the Spotlight section, and they got onto the story of, uh, you know, child abuse by priests in the Boston area. And people are talking about it a lot now because in Pennsylvania, the Attorney General just released a kind of a statewide survey of similar goings on with thousands of victims and stuff. But very interesting that, you know, and, and you know, uh, great testimony to what news does that 15 years earlier, a few journalists had tracked this down in Boston and exposed this and sort of brought this to everyone's attention without the power of the government to subpoena, to compel, you know, they, they just worked it out. And it's a great story. It's a pretty decent fictionalized account of it, too. So, so uh, whenever I see anything about kids now, I'm thinking about that. OK, finally, last one. We have, oh, we're out of time, basically. I should let you go. All right. But OK, your city has just spent $3.2 million to commission a piece of public art that looks a lot like a rusted out old car to some people. The radio talk shows are filled with callers on both sides of the issue. I guess I already sold that. Sorry, I don't know. So radio, I guess so, right? <laughs> radio, because it gives people an opportunity to call in and vent their opinions. But if it wasn't radio, where else could it go? Online. Online. Online, right? Take advantage of the interactivity, and it would be so much more rude and abusive than it would be <laughs> on the radio. All right, thanks, guys. Have a, have a good weekend. So uh, try to acquire the textbook. Read chapter two if you can. And next week, we'll start in with a little bit of writing and stuff. Jesse? There was an additional book or a PDF online. Yeah. It was a dead meat. Oh, really? Oh, I'll have to find it again. And I forgot to write down. 
Oh, well, let me find it, too, or if you want to email it to me, okay. okay. Yeah, that's, that's a... I'm going to type it up and it just kept on showing. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. I'll send you one. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for looking already for that, but it's so far in the future that we'll worry about that when we get there. Okay. I, 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 I